Good afternoon, everyone. This is Clay Chase with Torrey Hill Capital. Welcome to the NerveGen Pharma presentation podcast for July 18th, 2023. I trust and hope you're all doing well and having a great summer and uh, your weather's improving. Ours is out here. It's starting to turn into a regular uh, Southern California great summer. So I know you guys are out in Florida. I know you had some difficult weather out there, but uh, it looks like it's getting a little bit better. So glad you could join us today. Now, the company we're having on today is, as you, if you've seen them before, you know they're still flying under the radar, which is, it's a good thing and it's a bad thing. We love it because it allows us to have more time to get people, you know, involved and, and looking at the company. Uh, at the same time, I know the company's anxious to get, you know, their, their, uh, their 15 minutes of fame or more, which I think they're going to get a lot more. And this is one of those companies that we're really excited to bring to your attention because it's just one of those real diamonds in the rough that we're really excited about. And I think after you see this presentation, you're going to be excited about them as well. So what this company is bringing through the clinic, it's an early stage biotech company, and they're taking through the clinic a drug that promises to be truly transformative for neurodegenerative diseases and a whole bunch of different ones. I mean, we're talking about a drug that could stop the, not just stop the progression of these diseases, which is what most of the big pharma is trying to do. They're trying to find a way to arrest the advancement of these diseases. This is a drug that actually has the promise to actually turn back the clock on some of these diseases and show some repair. And that is a very, very significant uh, differentiator between us and some of the others out there in the market. The drug is called NVG291. And because it brings about repair or we think it can bring about repair. You can you can do these trials, and they they're a lot shorter than the other trials that show the arrest of the disease. You could do these trials in you know a lot shorter time frame, which I think is really key for if you're looking at this as a potential investment. NerveGen trades on the OTCQX ticker is N G E N F. On the TSX Venture, the ticker is N G E N. Shares are currently trading around $1.32 and a market cap of about $102 million. With us today to discuss NerveGen Pharma and their growth strategy going forward is the company's recently appointed CEO, Mr. Mike Kelly. And we also have as a special guest, the company's CMO, Mr. Dan Michael. Thanks, Clay. I appreciate it. And uh, hello, everybody. Welcome to the NerveGen presentation. My name is Mike Kelly. I'm CEO of NerveGen. With me today is Dan Michael. Uh, give uh, Dan a, a chance to introduce himself here in a few seconds. But first, I wanted to start off with a financial disclosure statement. I will be making some forward-looking statements on this call today. You'll be able to find our risk factors as well as uh, MDNA on CDAR.com, as well as on our web page. So as Clay mentioned, uh, we're, it's a very exciting time for our company. NerveGen, just some highlights here about the company. We're developing therapies to revolutionize treatment. Across a broad range of therapeutic indications, our first drug, MVG-291, is under development, or first drug candidate, is under development with uh, the potential to repair nervous system damage. And, and in fact, for clarity, uh, it allows the body to repair nervous system damages. There's demonstrated improvement in many different disease models, which I'll talk about today. Each of these indications that we're going to pursue are all significant in size and all have high unmet medical needs. Uh, and the most exciting part about the company today is we're about to embark on our phase 1B2A proof of concept trial in spinal cord injury. And Dan is gonna give you a little bit more information about our phase one data and uh, our phase two trial that we uh, hope to begin enrolling uh, in this quarter actually. So let me stop here and let Dan uh, introduce himself. Dan, if you want to come on screen, give you a chance to introduce yourself, then I'll introduce myself and the rest of the team. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Dan Michael. Uh, I'm a neurologist, and I am the chief medical officer at NerveGen. I have been for a little over two years. Uh, this is my first small biotech experience, and I'm enjoying it. I uh, have worked at four large pharma uh, companies, uh, including uh, EMD Serono, Novartis, Biogen, and um, most recently, uh, Amgen. 
before that, I had an academic career as a, as a neurologist. So why did I join NerveGen? Uh, I was looking for an interesting opportunity, more hands-on. Um, large companies, you, you know, there, there's a chance you can get lost and you don't feel as connected to patients. And I took my time looking for a CMO position before I actually signed up with uh, NerveGen. And the reason I, I joined was I just saw an amazing opportunity. There's incredible science backing up uh, this company. And I, I saw a huge opportunity to help patients. And that's what inspired me is there's some really nasty conditions that we um, are seeking. And first and foremost is spinal cord injury. And I think we have a real chance uh, to do something uh, special. And I, I don't think I could have lived with myself if I turned this down. So I, I joined and we're moving along and getting closer and closer to actually having some uh, real data. Thanks, Dan. I appreciate it. The, the rest of the team rounds out uh, Bill Adams, Matt Bay Lukachev, and Nana Collette all have 25 to 30 years experience in the pharmaceutical slash biotech uh, industry. Um, myself, I've been in the industry for 30 years, started out on the commercial side of the business, and the last several jobs that I had were in the C-suite. Um, my last job specifically was to head up uh, the U.S. and Canada in launching a product called Narcan Nasal Spray for Adapt Pharma, which was a, a very fulfilling uh, role for me. We took the product from zero to just under $300 million in net sales. Ultimately, the product was growing so fast, we ultimately had to sell it on to a company that could take it to the next level, Emergent Biosolutions. But I too joined the company just like Dan um, for very similar reasons. Dan was actually one of the reasons why I joined the company, um, as well as I did the diligence on, on the company myself and really wanted to make a difference in patients' lives. And this product, the first product in particular, has the ability to treat you know, a broad range of diseases, uh, is based in a lot of good preclinical data, which we'll talk about today. Uh, but we're, I'm very excited to be here, and uh, Dan, Dan and I are, are happy to present to you today. Let me get a little bit of the history of NerdGen. Many of you may have seen this already. Um, Jerry Silver was a, a key, um, well, Jerry Silver is the reason why we're all here, quite honestly. Uh, in the early 90s, uh, Jerry discovered a group of molecules called CSPGs, chondroitin sulfate proteoglycans. Um, and the, well, he, he discovered that they exist within the glial scar, which is causing inhibition for neural repair. And that, he, that was a very significant discovery, uh, which changed the thinking about allowing the body, you know, maybe we have the potential here to change uh, how the body could repair itself. Two decades later, through collaboration with Harvard, uh, they discovered a PTP sigma, which was a receptor uh, that's involved in the upregulation of CSBGs, uh, which gave them a target to start to look for molecules. And in 2015, uh, discovered 291R, which is the rodent version of our current 291. And in 2018, uh, NerveGen began by in licensing uh, the technology and the patents. Uh, from Case Western Reserve University. So what is the product? It's a self-penetrating peptide made of 35 amino acids in length. It's designed to, uh, to enhance cellular uptake. It's a sub-Q injection, meaning it's injected into the belly fat once daily. It's manufactured through chemical synthesis, and we have IP on this product uh, lasting through 2034. Here's a little bit of uh, how it works. This is a cartoon to illustrate uh, what I was talking about as far as the CSPGs and upregulating. Uh, up this is a cartoon that shows a glial scar that is uh, formed when an injury or a disease occurs. And you can see that these axons in purple um, are split and they're being prevented from regenerating or regrowing back together because of the CSPGs that are uh, potent inhibitors of, of regrowth and remyelination and plasticity. Uh, and, they, and they are upregulated 
upon uh, injury in a glial scar. When you introduce MVG-291, uh, we have evidence both in vitro as well as in vivo that we can enhance the body to regrow axons and remyelinate. Uh, myelination is the, is the green uh, tube-like um, tissue that is fatty substance that protects the axons here in the cartoon. Uh, very, very involved in, um, in, in many uh, different neurodegenerative diseases. One of the reasons Dan mentioned and I mentioned we joined the company is the multiple, multiple preclinical studies that were used and, and shown uh, improved CNS and peripheral nerve uh, recovery and functional recovery. Uh, here's just an example of uh, many of these different disease states. These, these are all preclinical models um, and all looked at functional endpoints. And there's a, there's a plethora of, of publications that show both motor sensory uh, function and repair, uh, which, you know, a key thing, key takeaway of this slide is not only the breadth of disease models where MVG-291 has shown an effect, but the multiple sites of which it has shown an effect. And what I mean by that, this is not just one single center, Case Western, uh, doing this work. Uh, this was replicated in many other institutions across the United States and also across the globe. So when you see other folks replicating the effect of 291 in various different disease models, you get confidence that this could be translatable into humans. The diseases that we're focusing on, starting from left to right, are spinal cord injury, stroke, ALS, MS, uh, and AD, Alzheimer's disease. All of these diseases um, are huge markets, multi-billion dollar marketplaces. All of them have current treatments that are um, okay, but not fantastic. Most, most of the products that are focused in these marketplaces are disease modifying agents, which means they're designed to slow the progression of the disease as opposed to what Clay talked about earlier, 291 uh, is, is a product that could actually allow the body to repair, which is a slightly different than modifying regression. Uh, and lastly, the unmet need in these marketplaces is tremendous. Uh, and it's the reason why we pick these disease states in addition to the preclinical data uh, to focus our efforts. Our primary focus, however, is spinal cord injury. This is gonna be uh, the lead indication that we're going after. Um, the primary reason for this is we have the most preclinical data in spinal cord injury. Uh, we've, we've seen a lot of, a lot of positive preclinical res results in 291R, uh, and it's a significant unmet medical need. I'll talk a little bit more about that now. To humanize this, um, the impact of this. Let me just briefly talk about uh, the patients here, or the or the individuals. They're not not patients, but individuals who suffered from a spinal cord injury. Average age is forty three years old. Majority of them are male, and at some point, uh, typically a vehicle or accident or a fall has caused a change in their life forever. So, in an instant, uh, their world has changed forever. Uh, they go through surgery. They go through rehab two to three months of rehab, uh, and um, they have impact on sensory and motor function for the rest of their life. So these are, these are individuals who are in the prime of their life, uh, and, and one instance has caused them uh, a tremendous impact, uh, not only financially, but emotionally. There are 18,000 new cases of spinal cord injury every year in the United States, there's roughly 300,000 people living with spinal cord injury today in the United States and worldwide, there's numbers that range between 250 and 500,000. The economic impact of spinal cord injury in the US is tremendous. Uh, for the first three months of the patient's life or the, or the individual's life, uh, the cost is roughly $200,000 per person. The lifetime cost can range anywhere between $1 million and $4 million. Uh, that depends on the age, uh, and the severity uh, of the injury. In addition to the economic impact, uh, there, there's other um, enormous costs to individuals, uh, shorter life expectancy, higher bankruptcy, 
um, you know, higher, um, higher incidence of, of depression. I'll walk through some of the preclinical hey, hey, data. Mike? Yes. Hey, Mike, sorry, I want to jump in with a real quick question on that, what you just covered there on the spinal cord injury. Now, those are the expenses um, for people who are just trying to live with their injuries, right? Correct. Those aren't for therapies, right? That's correct. And now, you know, I mean, occupational therapy and things like that, I understand that. But is there anything that realistically has any therapeutic efficacy for spinal cord injuries right now and another drug that works a little bit or anything like that? Or can you comment on that? You know, currently there's no drugs that approved for spinal cord injury. Um, the, the Probably the most popular things that are in the media as of late are um, uh, more on the device side, you know, electricity uh, being, being given to folks or, or devices not necessarily on the drug side. So, you know, I can ask Dan. Dan, are you are you familiar with any drugs that are avail available to, to help treat these patients? No, there's no drugs. Uh, but like you said, uh, there is emerging evidence that electrical stimulation um, combined with exercise can result in improvements, and that's in uh, chronic uh, spinal cord injury. Right. Okay. So there's really nothing that that you can take to make your make it better if you get this type of injury, right? Nothing, no. Nothing, no. Great. Well, that's great. Okay, thanks. This one of no, no problem. So I'm going to talk about two two different um, bodies of work that was done preclinically. One is acute, and what we call it acute is that is immediately post injury, uh, and as Dan mentioned, chronic. Chronic is after somebody has recovered and plateaued, and typically that's that's happening uh, a period of time post injury. Here, this is a study done in animals that looked at acute, pre, uh, acute injury. So if you look at the green bar, that's the MVG291R treated group compared to the placebo group or the vehicle group in blue. So you can see upon injury, uh, there's dramatic decrease in function. And the function is measured here by uh, what's called a BBB scale, a Basso BD Bresham rating scale. So 21 is, is uh, the highest end of the scale, and that's normal function. Less than five uh, is immobile. They're, they are not moving. And you can see that after the injury, there is some spontaneous recovery, even in the patients that have placebo. Uh, but there's dramatic improvement with patients, with, or patients, listen to me, rodents who are treated with uh, 291R. Uh, historically, there's other products that have been in development that show a two to three percent improvement, which was you know statistically significant and found to be robust. But our our recovery is up to eight to nine points on this scale, which is um, very very novel and very very new. Here's a video of of two of these animals. The left side shows the placebo group, and you can see by the the tail and the back legs are immobile. Um, and the right side is showing um, the 291R treated group. And to the naked eye, I'll show it again, just so you guys can get a, get a sense for the level. Um, the naked eye, it looks like the right-hand side, the 291 treated group is normal, um, but it, that's, that's upwards of a 15 on the scale that I just showed you. So it's dramatic improvement uh, in these animals. How long was the therapy or the drug administered in that model? Seven weeks. Seven weeks. Okay, great. So real quick. Yes. The great the, the grayed out period on the right hand side of this chart shows you the treatment period. Yeah, got it. Okay, great. Thanks. So now jumping to a different model and a different scale. This is a uh, four limb locomotor rating scale, which is basically a uh, fine digit function of the four limb and the, and the digits for the animals. Um, and you can see here that the animals were injured and then three months went by. So there was some spontaneous repair. Three months went by and then they plateaued in the vehicle group, but there was continued improvement in the treatment group. So these were, you know, treated for eight and a half weeks, but it would, the treatment didn't start until 12 weeks post injury. So this is a, a pretty remarkable recovery, seeing that after, after the uh, vehicle 
group has plateaued to see some function. But what's very interesting in this study, I think, is that even after uh, vehicle, the treatment period ended, there was continued improvement uh, in these animals beyond just the treatment period. So this gave us a lot of confidence that not only can we treat acute patients potentially, but we could also potentially treat chronic patients. This is a, a study done by Dr. Lang. It's, it's actually, uh, I, I picked this one out because bladder function, I was recently on a lot of market research and we talked to several patients and bladder function is a key quality of measure uh, in, of life in paralyzed patients. Uh, if, you, if they can regain bladder function, uh, they regain independence. So I think this, this study depicts a, a dose response um, of, bladder res of, of bladder function improvement in animals. And you can see that these doses are down around the 44 micrograms, which is much lower than the 500 micrograms on the two previous slides. So it gave a, it, this gives us hope and promise that uh, bladder function uh, will be improving um, in our upcoming clinical trials. I'm going to turn it over here to Dan. He's going to walk you through the phase one clinical trials, as well as the 1B2A that, that we have planned underway. Okay, thanks, Mike. So we have uh, completed a phase one trial in healthy subjects. Uh, and really, this trial had two parts. Uh, first, the first part, uh, subjects, 37 subjects were randomized to receive a single dose of either placebo or NVG-291, and we had six different dose levels of NVG-291, and then there was follow-up over the subsequent week. And the second part of the trial uh, enrolled 33 subjects uh, who received 14 consecutive injections of either placebo or NVG-291, and here we had four different dose levels of NVG-291. And again, we had a follow-up a week after the last uh, injection. I think what's important to note is the doses that we studied in this trial exceed the very broad range of doses that were tested in the preclinical um, models, uh, different models, uh, and shown to be efficacious. Uh, so we I, are aiming for a uh, a safe and uh, effective dose, and we're going towards the very high end of the efficacy uh, bar uh, based on the preclinical studies. Now, in terms of safety in this trial, the most common adverse event was injection site related. This was more common in the NVG291 arm. Uh, this isn't uh, that surprising with a subcutaneous injection. The vast majority of these events were mild, like 98%, uh, about 2% or so, one or 2% were moderate. There were no severe injection site related events uh, uh, and there are no serious adverse events at all uh, in the NVG291 treated uh, subjects. And other than injection site related events, there was no adverse event that was increased in the NVG291 group compared to placebo. And across all the other study parameters, uh, electrocardiograms, vital signs, laboratory studies, uh, there was no effect of NVG-291. Um, this slide doesn't mention pharmacokinetics, but we did measure pharmacokinetic uh, profile of NVG-291, both in the single dose group and the multiple dose group. And we have very nice uh, reproducible uh, pharmacokinetic uh, profiles of NVG-291 uh, that we can measure in the blood. Okay, so next slide. So as Mike said, the, there's a lot of preclinical efficacy data supporting NVG-291. Uh, the bulk of it comes from models of spinal cord injury, both acute and uh, chronic. So it makes sense that our first trial in patients uh, is gonna be a proof of concept trial in spinal cord injury. So this first trial is actually two trials in one. Uh, we have two separate cohorts and we'll be enrolling, the, enrolling them sequentially. The first is a chronic injury population. The second is a subacute injury population. The chronic uh, injury population is defined as one to 10 years post-injury. Subacute is defined as 10 
to 49 days post-injury. So we felt it was important to study these two extremes uh, given the results that we saw in animals where NVG291 worked both shortly after the injury as well as uh, after the uh, animals had already reached their plateau of recovery. So in these two cohorts, we'll be enrolling about 20 uh, subjects each to receive either placebo or NVG291. There's a 12-week treatment period and the total uh, study duration is 16 weeks. This study is going to be a single center study, um, which is a little bit unusual, uh, but the rationale for a single center study is that the, this allows for uniform assessments, uh, both clinical and electrophysiological, as well as uniform exercise. And together, this can reduce uh, any variability. And reducing variability is especially important for electrophysiological measurements, which we're uh, leveraging quite heavily in this study. Now, in terms of the objectives of the study, um, it should say study objectives, not safety objectives. Uh, the primary objective of the study is to assess the extent of connectivity, electrical connectivity, that's coming from the brain down through the spinal cord injury. And in spinal cord injury is essentially loss of connectivity. Some of the wires have been uh, cut. And so you don't get the signal. Uh, it's not as strong to certain muscle groups, which results obviously in, um, in weakness. So the co-primary endpoints for this study are to uh, measure the change in the amplitude, the strength of what's called the motor evoke potential to two specific muscle groups, one in the hand and one in the leg. And, and then we have six clinical outcome measures um, that look at performance tests of either the upper or the lower extremities. And then we have a couple of uh, neurological assessments that will actually grade muscle strength. And then we have additional secondary endpoints that will look at other electrophysiological measures. Uh, we're actually looking at 10 muscle groups in all bilaterally, um, looking at changes in motor vote potential amplitudes, latencies. Uh, there's quite a long list that's going to give us a lot of information um, about the extent of connectivity and how that changes. And then finally, for exploratory endpoints, we have some additional clinical measures, including assessment of bladder function. Um, spasticity, mobility, change in quality of life, and plasma biomarkers. Before we leave this slide, I just want to make one other point, and that is the patient population. It's not stated on the slide, but we're going to be enrolling individuals who have some residual motor function. Um, there's something called the Asian impairment scale. It goes from A to E, where A and B, there's no motor function whatsoever. That's A and B. We'll be essentially enrolling uh, patients who are a Asia impairment scale C and D, that is they have some degree of residual motor function. And the reason we're doing that is the animal studies, all of them, are uh, these are all models that are motor incomplete models. And I think it's possible that one of the reasons that uh, therapies developed for spinal cord injury have failed in the past, they may just have been ineffective, but Typically, the, the clinical trials have enrolled individuals who are the most severe, Asia A and B. And so we're taking a more careful approach to clinical translation. Okay, and then uh, if you could advance the slide, Mike. So I just want to show the list of advisors that we've been using. Um, this is an amazing group of uh, consultants who've been on our advisory board since before I joined the company. And I'll just walk through them quickly. So uh, James Guest is professor of neurosurgery at the University of Miami and the Miami Project to Cure. Has very strong interest in spinal cord injury, clinical trials. He runs his own clinical trials uh, as well. And he's a very thoughtful and uh, critical uh, expert in the field. Steve Kirschblum is professor and chair of physical medicine and rehab at Rutgers and chief medical officer for Kessler uh, Rehabilitation. Brian Kwan is professor in the Department of Orthopedics at the University of British Columbia um, and uh, the Canada Research Chair in Spinal Cord Injury. He's also heading the international uh, effort for the uh, 
biobank uh, of spinal cord injury uh, clinical trials. Linda Jones is a physical therapist, so she brings a different perspective. She is um, one of the co-leads of the Spinal Cord Outcome Partnership Endeavor scope, and she's chair of the Research Committee of Asia, which is one of the conferences that's held annually, the American Spinal uh, Injury Association. And her real interest is on uh, development of the optimal uh, outcome measures. And then finally, Dan Lamertz is a professor of physical medicine and rehab at the University of Colorado and emeritus clinical scientist at Craig Hospital in um, Colorado. And he has been involved in clinical trials really for decades, and he's got an amazing experience that he brings to the table. And so this group we've been working with very closely, um, they have helped us with the design, um, eligibility criteria, all the elements of the trial that's about to start. And we're also working with them uh, planning the next trial, which will be a multi-center trial where the primary outcome measure would be um, looking at clinical efficacy. Okay, thanks, Mike. I'll turn it back to you. Thanks, Dan. So that's kind of, that's a review of uh, the product, the different disease states that uh, we, we are going to be entering into um, and heavy focus on spinal cord injury. This is a depiction of our pipeline uh, where you can see that spinal cord injury is much further along than, than others, but we do have some preclinical data in stroke. Um, the other exciting thing about this slide uh, for the first time, we, we are announcing that we have another product candidate uh, that we are that is coming out of discovery and moving into preclinical. Uh, we our anticipation is to do preclinical work in uh, the following disease states for MVG 300. Uh, it was internally developed. Uh, and we're excited to move that product forward as well. We have a, a, a large board of directors that have you know, very seasoned experience, uh, not only in starting companies, Bill Ryback and Harold Punit are the founders of the organization, but, but folks that have had significant positions in running startup biotech companies and uh, on the, both the medical side as well as the C-suite level. And we have key partners in Goodwin, KPMG, and Paramel, who's our manufacturer. Our share capital structure, as Clay mentioned early, uh, we're, we're trading on TSX and OTCQX. Uh, recent share price is $1.73 Canadian, $1.28 US. 59, just over 59 million shares outstanding, 21%, just under 22% is insider owned. And our last uh, March 31st, uh, you know, we we uh, our financials pointed out that we have thirteen point three million dollars uh, in the bank. Some of the key value drivers, obviously, today we it was a heavy focus on this clinical trial. Uh, where the where the trial, um, a couple of milestones that we just passed. The FDA has given us the green light to move ahead with this trial, which was a big hurdle for the company, and we've been working on that for quite some time. Uh, we also Wings for Life, which was on the 1B2A uh, slide clinical trial design has, uh, we've announced that we have a collaboration with them and they're, uh, they're putting $3 million towards this clinical trial. Um, the next step is IRB approval, which is imminent. We expect to get first patient dosed uh, in the third quarter of this year. In addition to that, so that's, that's the large uh, next big inflection point for the company. In addition to that, uh, I showed you on the pipeline slide, we have uh, preclinical data that we're, we're hoping to get in other indications, as well as our next generation MVG 300 uh, progressing uh, in tw late 2023, early 2024. But the key, you know, biggest value driver, I believe, in, in the near term for this organization is that the chronic cohort, since this is a pool of patients um, that have been injured for quite some time, um, we are expecting that we'll be able to enroll that group rather quickly and get a readout from that portion of the clinical trial. We'll have a chronic cohort readout, an acute cohort readout, and a combined data readout, but we expect the chronic cohort readout to be mid-2024, and that's probably the biggest, most exciting component of, of the company in, in the next 12 months. With that, I will stop and turn it over to Clay.
great presentation, guys. Really exciting. Uh, every time we hear, hear this, we get uh, even more excited about it. Uh, that's neat. I, I didn't realize that you had this new uh, compound already out that's or announced. It's exciting. And then I also saw that you had some people from Craig, Craig uh, Center in Colorado, which is interesting to me because my mom used to work there and she was quite, uh, you know, entrenched with uh, everyone that had uh, these, you know, spinal cord injuries. She, she was quite uh, enthusiastic about anything that could help these people for sure. So that's great. Um, if you have a question, there's one popped up just there on Q. Uh, but if you have, do you have a question, go ahead and ring in on Q&A. Um, what is the burn rate and are any warrants to be exercised in the money at this time? Good questions. Uh, the burn rate is between three and four million dollars a quarter. Obviously, as we enter into clinical trials, that burn is is likely going to go up. It's probably going to be a little bit less for last quarter because we were in the in the uh, changeover from phase one to phase two. Uh, but roughly three to four million dollars. Uh, as far as the schedule of warrants, I don't believe we've publicly announced. Um, how many warrants are in the money and what the schedule of warrants is. I need to check with uh, our CFO, Bill Adams, to see what our public disclosure of that information is. Okay. Well, maybe we can get some information on that and send it out to you. Sure. Um, if there's any more questions, do go ahead and uh, go on your Q&A icon, your chat icon, or you can raise your hand. Um, you know, if I'll make a quick, uh, what I noticed on these, this type of company is it's, if you put together a wish list of everything you wanted out of a, a, an ideal biotech investment, I think this checks just about every box. It's got, you know, you're addressing very large markets. There's, there's really very little or no existing standard of care for any of these indications. You have multiple indications that the drug could be applied to. You're currently in a low market cap condition. You're, you know, around $100 million, which is not very much. And you've got a lot of near-term milestones. You're not four, five, six years away from getting some kind of an answer whether it works. Uh, you're, you know, maybe a year away or something like that. So I think it's it's really an ideal type of investment opportunity here for people who are looking for that type of investment. We've got another question here. But Clay, uh, before, you, before you get to the next question, I did get a response from our CFO who's, who's online that... Um, Oh great! I could have brought. I should have brought his uh, microphone up, but I, yeah, I, no, no problem. There, there's no, there's no no warrants in the money um, currently, uh, and this is the warrants are public in our financial filings, so you should be able to find them online. Great. Okay. Uh, any mention of a partnership with a major at this time? Not at this time. You know, we we believe. Um, you know, we, we've had discussions in the past with, with several folks. Our focus right now has been internal, uh, which is to get this clinical trial up and running. Uh, obviously, you know, when we when we get a chronic data readout mid-year next year, we, we will likely uh, have some inbound interest from, from external right. parties. But, but our goal right now is to take this product, as, you know, ourselves forward. Um, as we progress, MVG 300 into other indications, some of these larger indications, uh, it may make sense to uh, collaborate to financially fund some of those. But uh, right now there's, you know, to answer the question directly, there's no no discussions going on with external parties. Yeah, that that, that makes sense to me because you you know, you've got with the money you have on hand, you have, you know, three, four quarters possibly, you could progress this the, the MVG 291 through the clinic and maybe get an indication on spinal cord injury, which I think would be a major inflection point for the company. Uh, at that point, you, you know, really probably increase the value significantly from there. So, you know, I like the fact that you're not looking at most of the early stage companies that have to partner, they, they partner because they have to, they, they don't have capital to move forward. And that's one thing that you guys have never really had any trouble raising money. Um, that's for sure. So that's everything you've done has been kind of oversubscribed. Um, today's code word is NVG300, the new compound. And you'll need that for your feedback report. Uh, I think we're getting close to our uh, time, time limit here. So I'm going to go ahead and start to wrap this up. If you have a question, please do ring in. Uh, we'll get this answered for you. 
Uh, in the meantime, if you'd like to get information or additional information on NerveGen, you can do that on their website at www.nervegen.com. Uh, a lot of background about the drug, some of the indications, the clinical trial roadmap and things like that are all on the website as well as this presentation and some of the videos as well. And there's actually some more videos on the website than what we showed today, some for stroke model and things like that as well. So do go over there and, and you can get a lot of the information there. If you have additional questions for Dan or Mike, you can get a hold of me and, and I can get you guys in contact with them. Um, anything you'd like to add, uh, either one of you, before we wrap up today? Well, thank you very much for your time. I appreciate it and keep us... Uh... You know, put our put our ticker in your in your search. You'll you'll start to see some news flow over the next couple of months. Great, we'll do that. Okay, guys, thanks so much for coming on today. Really appreciate the update. Uh, I want to thank everyone for coming on, listening to the program. We um, appreciate your uh, your particip participation, and we look forward to having you on a future presentation with Toriel Capital. If you'd like to see this again, or if you have someone that you'd like to share this with, we are going to be putting this. Uh, presentation up on our YouTube channel. Just send me an email and I can send you a link. It'll probably be up there sometime in the next 24 hours or something like that. Okay, until next time, be safe and be well. Thanks again, guys. Look forward to talking to you both real soon. Thanks, guys. Take care. Thanks. You bet. Take care.